This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you again for listening. This is episode 20, and so I thought I'd do something a little bit different. So the title of this podcast, as you know, is The Moral Imagination. And so in this episode, this is a talk I gave on The Moral Imagination, what it is and how we can develop it. So in this talk, I discuss the origins of the term in Edmund Burke's reflection on the French Revolution and his worry that the Enlightenment reductionist view of reason that was taking hold would lead to what C.S. Lewis later called the abolition of man. So I discuss a number of thinkers, including Gertrude Himmelfarb on tradition, Russell Kirk, Joseph Pieper, Mary Douglas on condensed symbols, Ian McGilchrist on neuroscience, Peter Berger on plausibility structures, and more. And then the second half of the talk, I move from a theoretical more to the practical. And I outline 15 ways, both practical and theoretical, how we can build and develop our moral imagination. And so some of these include reading good stories and the importance of fairy tales, and both not just for children, but for adults as well. Resensitizing ourselves to good and evil, recovering the idea that beauty is both objective and subjective, the rehabilitation of reason, a theme I discuss a lot on this podcast, recovering authentic subjectivity, why language matters and how abusive language leads to abuse of power, and why we need to build plausibility structures, go outside, and cultivate silence. So I gave this lecture as part of the Authenticum Lecture Series in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So you can learn more at uh, www.authenticumseries.com. So I'll put a link to that and also to the many of the books and essays I discuss in this lecture. I'll put that all on my website at themoralimagination.com. I also have an outline and some extra resources and quotes on the website if you'd like to follow along with the talk. So I I go through these 15 ideas to develop the moral imagination. I give a number of suggested reading, fairy tales, and other other books. But if you have any other ideas, suggestions, uh, please um, let me know. Go to the comment page, and I'd be very happy to hear from you. So thank you again for listening. Next week, I'll be back with an interview. And as always, if you like the podcast, please consider writing a review, and please do share with your friends and family. I hope you enjoy my talk on the moral imagination and how we can develop and build it in our lives. So the phrase, the moral imagination, comes from the writings of Edmund Burke. So this is a phrase we hear quite often, but it it finds its origin in in the writings of Edmund Burke uh, and his book, Reflections on the Revolution in France. Uh, Burke was, as many of you know, a leading Irish-English political figure and literary figure in the 18th century and was also one of the leading liberal figures of his time, which is kind of funny because we tend to think of Burke as a, the father of Anglo-American conservative uh, thought. So he's, he's really the father of conservatism and yet was really a leading liberal thinker of his time. Um, Adam Smith said it was one of the people that he had no correspondence with who shared many of his ideas about a market economy. He was a proponent, with some reservation, of the American Revolution. He was an advocate for the rights of the Irish against English oppression. He said that the Irish penal laws were some of the worst laws ever devised by man to oppress another people. He advocated for the rights of the Indians against English colonialists and colonial abuse, especially in the Hastings trial. He was opposed to the slave trade. And he actually thought that even though he was in support of the American Revolution, that Americans should not have representation in Parliament because they own slaves. So he talked about ideas for helping to end slavery in the United States. And he said that the first thing that we need to do is reconstitute the African family that had been broken apart through slavery. So he was this leading liberal thinker and was a Rockingham Whig. And yet, despite all of these liberal bona fides, he is the father of conservatism. And and the reason for that really comes to his one, the one revolution he did not like. And that was the French Revolution. He was a fierce, fierce critic of the French Revolution. And here he departed even from many liberal figures who thought he was out of his mind. But as events unfolded, just like Burke predicted, admitted, no, Burke, Burke was right. So Burke's a complex thinker, and I'm not going to spend all the time talking about Burke, but I think to get the idea of what the moral imagination is and where we're going and what's happening, we contextualize it in Burke, I think, becomes very helpful. 
So one of the ways I like to summarize Burke in a very, very pedantic, elegant manner is to say, one of the ways to understand Burke is Burke says, you can't just do stuff. You can't just see a problem and say, oh, we're going to create a brand new solution to every problem. You can't just react and think, we'll just change everything and it'll all fall into place. Burke is aware of the complexity of life, of complex systems, of tradition, of what we'll talk about later, inarticulate rationality, all these things that are going on. And oftentimes we only see just the top. And so when we see a problem, we're like, oh, we're just going to fix it. And Burke says, wait, you can't just do stuff because there's going to be a lot of negative externalities, as economists talk about. There are going to be a lot of negative effects because things are much more complex than we realize at first glance. So we need to act then with prudence, understanding complexity in systems. So the world is complex and context matters. That's the first thing. Now, one of his critiques of the French Revolution was that it was hyper-rationalist and therefore had this reductionist, constrained notion of human life, of human reason, of human relationships, and of society. So, as many of you know, the French Revolution was incredibly radical, right, and became very anti-clerical, but it was so radical that it was going to restart absolutely everything, even the calendar. So they were going to have a 10-day calendar system. Now, if you think about why do we have a calendar? Well, the calendar is connected to the moon and weeks, and of course, it's also connected to the Hebrew Bible and the tradition. But we have this kind of a mix of inheritance and a mix of reflection of reality. And the French said, none of that matters. We're going to start over. So it was this radical change. And of course, as you might have discovered, it didn't work. But, uh, but the calendar is just one example of what Chesterton would call the democracy of the dead. Dead people get a vote in what we do. And this is something that's really at the heart of Burke's thinking, that he talks about a social contract, for example. In social contract theory, I have a lot of problems with social contract theory. But Burke's social contract theory is a bit different. He talks about we're in a partnership between the dead, the living, and the yet to be born. And so there is this connection over time. That's the social contract. Not the social contract, say, of Hobbes or Locke, which is a kind of a radical individual, right, who pops out of nowhere. For Burke, the human being is born into a family, born into a culture, born into a language. Right, so this is part of his critique, then, of the French Revolution, um, that the democracy of the dead was rejected. Um, in, when we think about tradition, it's trial and error. It's heuristics. It's all these experiences that our ancestors have worked through and solved and that we inherit those. And if we think, oh, well, I don't fully understand why that's the case, and we jettison it, Burke says, we can come into deep, serious problem. Um, and he predicted that there would be incredible violence in the French Revolution precisely because of this. So Burke said, the problem is we took, put too much faith in what he called economists, calculators, and sophists, and that everybody was operating on this very reductionist, limited concept of reason, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, that was part of some of the Enlightenments, especially the French Enlightenment, English Enlightenment, German Enlightenment. And they were ignoring everything else that did not fit into their small, constricted, rationalist framework. And so, to summarize then, Burke made it clear that there's much more going on than the Enlightenment rational articulation can see. And this is the beginning of his critique. So in response to this hyper-rationalism of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, Burke said a couple of things. He said, we need to recover tradition. The great 19th century uh, historian and literary critic Gertrude Himmelfarb wrote in her book, The Moral Imagination from Burke to Trilling, she tells of a story of, a, she, was, she uh, was teaching, and she had a, a young Jewish student who missed class, and she was a very conscientious student. And Himmelfarb wondered, well, why did she miss class? And so she saw her the next day and said, you know, I noticed you weren't in class. Is everything okay? And her student said, oh, I'm really sorry. It was a, a Jewish holiday and I, I, had to, I couldn't work. And 
Himmelfarb is Jewish and she's a little bit sheepish about the whole thing. Like, oh, okay, this is kind of a minor holiday. I should be paying attention to these things. And, uh, well, I've noticed you're taking your Judaism more seriously. And the student said, yes, yes, I've been reading Burke. And this partially surprised Himmelfarb because Burke does have some anti-Semitic comments. You know, there's like a little bit of anti-Semitism there. But he says, well, well why? She says, well, he encouraged me to take Judaism seriously because he encouraged me to take tradition seriously. And that realizing that the trial and error of thousands of years, maybe, just maybe, has some wisdom for us. Maybe there's something for me to learn and to listen to. So uh, this week was Rosh Hashanah, which is, it's not exactly Jewish New Year. It is Jewish New Year. It's actually the universe's New Year. Uh, and Rosh Hashanah, because there's also a Jewish New Year that's at the beginning of, of uh, with Passover, right? Um, and um, I think it is now year, someone can correct me, 5,780 maybe, 79, 80, 81, 80, did I get it right? 5,780 in the Jewish calendar. That's 5,780 years of wisdom, reflection, trial and error, debate, discussion, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe tradition has something to teach me. And she got this, she got this respect for tradition from reading Burke. So Burke said we have to recover our tradition. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. The other thing Burke said, or related, is he said we need to recover prejudices. Now, this sounds very strange to modern ears, right? Because we're not supposed to be prejudiced. Um, and in one sense, you're not. You're not supposed to prejudge people. Um, and he does not, but he does not mean that you shouldn't dislike people of another ethnicity or race, okay? Now, as I said, Burke had some problems with that a little bit, but that, that's not what he means. What he means, or what he meant, is in relation to tradition, we need to think about the context of traditions and what we do and why these things are important. And in fact, that there's lots of things we do based on tradition, as I said, on heuristics, trial and error. And what the, the philosopher, the Hungarian philosopher, Michael Polanyi calls inarticulate rationality. And that we, we're, we don't know exactly why we're doing these things. And the French Revolution and the Enlightenment said, all prejudice, all tradition's bad, you need to get rid of it. And he says, no, we need to recover some of those prejudices. That is, some of the, the ideas from our forefathers that help us make better decisions about how to live. So let me uh, do a very brief summary of inarticulate rationality, because this is a big, a big kind of concept. Michael Polanyi was a Hungarian scientist, and a very short uh, on Michael Polanyi, I thought it was fascinating. He, he wrote a doctoral dissertation, and he turned it in, and it's fantastic. And he's, he's Karl Polanyi is a very famous writer who wrote The Grand Great Transformation. He's just from a very famous Hungarian family. And he, he turned in his dissertation and said, this is fantastic. So they're re reviewing it. And they said, wait, you, you made a mistake in the mathematics. And he goes, oh, sorry. I'll go back and fix that. And the reviewers, what do, you, what do you mean? How did you get the answer right if you made a mistake in the mathematics? He's like, oh, no, no, I got the answer a long time ago. I just went back and figured out the math. Well, you can't do that. That's not scientific method. He goes, sure worked, didn't it? <laughs> and he began to turn his attention to philosophy of science and realized that actually sometimes we intuit things. We are able to figure things out that we then can go back and prove. Not always. We also, as you know, make lots of mistakes with intuition, right? Sometimes our intuition is, intuition is trustworthy, sometimes it's not. But in this case, it worked. And so he began to think, what is inarticulate rationality? So sometimes we'll hear, um, if you don't know how to explain it, then you don't know what it is. How many times have either you heard that or said that to your children or to students or whatever? So I ask you, how do you ride a bicycle? Now, most of you in this room know how to ride a bicycle, and I think maybe a few of you know the physics of how a bicycle works. If you don't know how the physics of a bicycle works, you don't know how to ride a bicycle. Right? If you, how many of you play an instrument? Maybe the violin. How many of you know um, 
how the strings work and all the physics of sound. Well, Polanyi's point is there are a lot of things that we know that we cannot articulate. And I have in your, in your uh, reading list uh, one of the uh, a neuroscientists named Ian McGilchrist, who actually, this is very short, there's a lot here, but talks about the hemispheres and how the hemispheres work. And it's not the popular stuff you hear about, like right is creative, left is, it's not that. But there's things going on where the left hemisphere is the center of language. And you can actually learn things that you can't articulate. And there's a, a neuroscientist named Joseph Ledoux who's done studies who, when he was young. He does work on emotions now, but on split brain patients. And if, if, if you've had epilepsy in a split brain patient, you have the corpus callosum is cut. Um, the right and left hemispheres don't, don't talk to each other. So if you show somebody, say, an, an apple in the right eye, and you say, what do you see? And they'll say, an apple, because the left hemisphere sees it. You show them an apple in the left eye that goes to the right hemisphere, what do you see? Then you give them a bag and you, and, you, it's, and you put their hand in there and say, pick out what you saw. They pick out an apple. So you can't necessarily articulate everything you know, even in, like, in neuroscience is showing this. But Polanyi is talking about it in a much deeper way as well, that we don't, our, like our, when our lives, our experiences a lot of them are not fully articulate. And because of that, hyper-rationalism doesn't work. We have to rely upon the democracy of the dead. We have to rely upon inherited tradition. Now, and that's Burke's worry. That's Burke's worry. Now, it does not mean that if it's traditional, it must be right, because there are some traditional things that are wrong. Um, there are many cultures that practice ch child sacrifice. That's a tradition. It doesn't mean it's right. It's a moral evil. Right? So it's not suggesting just because it's traditional it's good, but the, but the contrary is also not true. Just because it's traditional doesn't mean it's archaic and unrelated to our life. And that's what Burke is worried about in his critique of the um, French Revolution. And this is why, by the way, I also highlighted in the beginning that Burke the advocate of tradition, supported four of the five revolutions of his time. So he's not saying, so Marx called Burke a sycophant for power. But I think that's, uh, like many of Marx's insights, wrong. Uh, and I think evident by the fact that he was such a supporter of all these revolutions. So there's the context for Burke. Now, that's all great, Mr. Miller, but I came here for the moral imagination. <laughs> are we going to talk about fairy tales? No, no, yes, we are. We are. So, to the moral imagination. In this, it's in this critique of the hyper, of hyper rationalism and his book on the reflections of the French Revolution that Burke uses the term the moral imagination. And in your handouts, I have the quote that you can read along with. It obviously goes on, but this is the short part. He says, All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. All the superadded ideas furnished from a wardrobe of a moral imagination, which the heart owns, and the understanding ratifies. The heart owns and the understanding ratifies. The moral imagination... He says, he says, it's necessary to cover the defects of our naked and shivering nature and raise our nature to dignity in our own estimation. All of these things, these ideas, are to be exploded as ridiculous, absurd, and antiquated fashion. End quote. So Burke is saying we have these concepts, these ideas, the wardrobe of our moral imagination that help us understand heroism and beauty and goodness and truth and justice and fidelity. It provides wisdom and inarticulate rationality to understand what is good and right and how to live well, not only for ourselves, but for society. So we're not simply left to our own accord. We don't have to invent everything on our own. We are part of a larger tradition. Again, the democracy of the dead. So Russell Kirk, whose wife is here, 
It's always fun to quote Russell Kirk in front of Annette. You feel like she has a red pen out. Like, it wasn't exactly like that. <laughs> now, Russell Kirk, who's a very important writer on, 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 the, on the moral imagination, and in fact has a little collection, which I'll, I'll talk about at the end. Remind somebody, please ask me, there's a collection of some of his writings on the moral imagination that you can get from the Kirk Center uh, that I, I highly recommend. So Kirk explains, quote, the moral imagination aspires to the to the, aspires to the apprehending of right order in the soul and right order in the commonwealth. It is, this is, this is Kirk, it is the moral imagination which informs us concerning the dignity of human nature, which instructs us that we are more than naked apes. So it's the moral imagination through or through that that we learn about our dignity our goodness and our fallenness, our capacity for profound good and our capacity for profound evil. Now, of course, what happens when you remove the moral imagination? We lose a sense of dignity of ourselves and the dignity of others. And of course, this is why Burke predicted violence in the French Revolution and why he was right. So I'll return to that in, in a minute. So these ideas, so, so where do these come from? Well, they come from a number of sources that I'm going to talk about. But of course, one of the places they come from is from stories. As young boys and girls, we are taught we should be honest, we should be brave, we should be noble, we should be generous. We learn it from instruction from our parents. We learn it from scolding from our parents, as some of the, the young uh, uh, men and women here can attest. Uh, we learn it from stories and fairy tales, especially, which I'll talk about. So Gertrude Himmelfarb, T.S. Eliot, Russell Kirk have all com commented that literature is supposed to be a teaching force to give us ideals and aspirations about our dignity and then call us to a higher life. So let me give a quick example, and then I'm going to go back into explaining the moral imagination a little bit and what happens. My brother-in-law, Christopher Warner, some of you know Christopher, he, uh, he's moved here several years ago. Um, and he used to be a fourth grade teacher, and he was a former Marine. And every summer he runs a thing called Warrior Camp. Has anybody been to Warrior Camp? Okay, so Warrior Camp is for fathers and sons. Uh, and I've gone twice, or maybe three times now, and it's exhausting. Uh, so all the boys are carrying guns, and you're sure you're going to die, even though they're not loaded. So... <laughs> And you have to get up in the middle of the night and do fire watch and do night prayer. It's wonderful. He does a really, really good job. But amidst all this training and martial arts and uh, war training, he'll tell stories. And one of the tell stories he tells is um, the stories of warrior saints. And one of them is a saint named Mercurius. And Mercurius was a great hero of the Roman Empire. He was a Roman general that had been called to do battle against pirates uh, who were attacking a town. And he ended up defeating all of them in this very heroic campaign. And he came back from, from his battles and was given the garland and awarded by Caesar and all of Rome honored Mercurius. And he was deeply, he was just like a very famous general. Well, Mercurius was actually a Christian general. And um, not long after his, his triumph, the persecution of Christians began. And in order to avoid that, you would have to offer incense to the gods, right? That's not much different today, although we're not killed for it. There's a softer offering of incense today with political correctness. You have to offer incense. Right? We're not killed for it, but that's what you're doing. You can not get tenure. You can, there's difficulties if you don't offer incense uh, to the gods of radical, um, radical egalitarianism. Uh, but there is even more dangerous because you would be killed. And he said, I can't do it. And his friend said, listen, you've got to, you've got to do it. I know you're a Christian. It does, don't mean it. Just do it. He said, no, I can't do it. There's one God and I won't offer incense to the false gods. This is not a big deal. Just keep it quiet. Now, this is a highly decorated Roman general and a friend of Caesar's. And he said, I won't do it. So he was killed for not offering incense to the gods. And as I remember, Christopher explained to the boys, what we see here, boys, is that sometimes you do the right thing and you're going to be rewarded and honored and with fame. And sometimes you're going to do the right thing and you're going to be punished 
and maybe even killed for it. But the key is to do the right thing. Now here these boys have been out at warrior camp running and camping, and they're hearing these stories, and these stories are seeping into their mind, into their soul. They're ready to be inspired. When difficult times come, they can think of Mercurius. They can gather courage. They can stand strong in the face. Maybe they go to college, and they're told, come on, you don't believe that stuff. You know, I went to the University of Notre Dame, which is a wonderful place to become a Protestant. Um, <laughs> But when I was there, I remember, I remember, um, I, this is not a, a testament of my courage, just a testament of the fact that I'm, I, I was out of it. But I remember they said, who believes in angels? And I was like, and I looked around, I think I was the only one raising my hand. I was like, and then I thought, do I believe in angels? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I, I believe in angels. You know, but it didn't take that much courage. I was, too, I was too dumb to need courage. But anyway, uh, nevertheless... The points are you're going to be asked even little tiny things like white martyrdom. And these, this story, well, if Mercurius can, can offer his life to not offer incense, I surely don't have to offer incense to the New York Times. Right? So, but in the French Revolution and much of the Enlightenment, these high ideals, religion, tradition, ceremony are thrown out. They're not rational. But Burke said, don't think that simply trusting in cold, calculating reason will be enough. Because... When you throw out the moral imagination, violence will ensue. Now, for those of you who know the 20th century English writer, C.S. Lewis, you'll notice there are some themes between Burke and C.S. Lewis' very, very important book, The Abolition of Man. May I ask how many people have read The Abolition of Man? Okay, wonderful. For those who haven't, this is the greatest book. You need to read it, go home, read it tonight. At least read the first 15 pages or so, which is called Men Without Chests which is his first chapter. Lewis says, we've created men without chests. We think our intellects are really big, but it's actually our chests that are atrophied, so our heads just look big. But it's just our chests are small. He said, our hearts and deepest humanity have been removed. He writes in The Abolition of Man, quote, and do I have this in your handout? Yes. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. This removal of the chest, of all the ideas that inspire us to be noble, are removed. And Lewis says, this will lead to the abolition of man to the destruction of man himself. And for the record, Benedict XVI often quotes this importance of the abolition of man. You can see it. He actually uses this language uh, as well. So <clears throat> what Lewis says is the, the way we live well is that the head rules the belly through the chest. Now, in case you're not exactly following, let me be clear. I'm talking about the moral imagination and removing the moral imagination, the wardrobe of the moral imagination, getting into this cold, calculating, rational self is the same thing as removing the chest. So you have the intellect and the passions. But Lewis says the head rules the belly through the chest, through the moral imagination. So what does he mean by that? That it's through, that, that the, the intellect doesn't have enough power to control the passions of anger, lust, fear, cowardice, avarice, greed, alone. It needs the noble ideas of fidelity, image of the hearth, the home, mercy, compassion. And it can't rule the passions alone. So let me tell you how I explain C.S. Lewis this point. So imagine that your belly is a 500-pound gorilla, okay? I want, I want money, I want pleasure, I want power, I want. And your intellect is a little professor with a bow tie. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> I'm not sure if you realize that catechism 2248 <laughs> says that you are not allowed to do those things you are desiring. 
I want. Okay? The intellect cannot control the passions without the chest. The intellect needs the chest. Now, you see a similar image in Plato's Phaedrus uh, for the Platonists here. There's like three or four Platonists always around. <clears throat> Only the chest can rule the passion. When it does so in concert with high ideas of goodness, nobility, bravery, and mercy, how do you stay faithful in war? Not to keep the GDP high. But the hearth, the home, your family, women, children. What keeps a man faithful in marriage? The image in his mind of his wife, of love, the children, the hearth, and his commitments, his promises. These are part of the moral imagination. These are part of the chest. These are the things that inspire us to fullness of humanity. And these are the very things that Burke and Lewis after him and Kirk and others all worried would be cast away and all you'd have is cold, calculating man. But how many of you read The Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis? All right, wonderful. So there's a character in there called Eustace Scrub, right? And he almost deserved it. <laughs> so Eustace Scrub, remember, he is the abolished man. He's the abolished man. All the noble ideas are gone. He's just a cold, calculating little boy, oh, etc. But Lewis knows Eustace Scrub doesn't stay that way. He turns into Weston in the Space Trilogy. His cold, calculating intellect becomes taken over by his diabolical passion for desire, for power. And so what Burke is worried about, and Lewis and Kirk and Eliot after them, is that when you remove the moral imagination, there is a vacuum, and the vacuum will get filled. Now, Kirk, following Burke, T.S. Eliot, and Irving Babbitt, gives a very good explanation of what happens when we lose the moral imagination. First, we get the idyllic imagination, and then ultimately the diabolical imagination. So, Irving Babbitt called it the idyllic imagination. Instead of a moral imagination, when that's gone, we get this idea that we see in thinkers like Rousseau and Marx, that evil comes from the outside. And if we can just restructure society, the economy, property, family, education, whatever it may be, we can eradicate evil and we can create heaven on earth. This is what the philosopher Eric Vogelin calls to immunitize the eschaton. So the eschaton are the final times when Jesus comes and establishes the, king, the kingdom of God. No, we're going to take that and we're going to establish it right here, right now, ourselves. We will bring the final times now. And here we see a recurring motif of the Tower of Babel. That is a political and technical solution to the problem of evil, suffering, and death. This is the idyllic imagination. But as we know, all these plans of utopianism always disappoint us, and they enslave us. Communism, German National Socialism, or the current secular pagan technocracy of our day will only enslave and disappoint us. So that's the first thing, the idyllic imagination. And as that fails, because there's one thing that always stops the idyllic imagination, and that's called the human person. The broken, fallen human person will always get in the way of all idyllic, imaginative, utopian schemes. You just don't know what to do with us. We can't be fixed. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, evil runs through the human heart. As G.K. Chesterton said, as some of you know, in an essay contest, is that there was an essay contest in, the English, in an English newspaper said, what's wrong with the world? And Chesterton submitted his answer. Dear sirs, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so the, when the idyllic falls, we see a move toward the diabolical imagination. And T.S. Eliot calls it the evil spirit, the anti-moral imagination. He said, when the moral imagination fails, the uh, sorry, the idyllic imagination and a moral fail. Eliot says, quote, the number of people in possession of any criteria for discriminating between good and evil is very small. 
what happens is raw, perverse sentiment. As Joseph Ratzinger says in Truth and Tolerance, that an irrational will is not a free will, it's a diabolical will. Ratzinger said that after the Benedict XVI, after the fall of communism, relativism didn't die, but mixed with the desire for gratification to create a potent, potent combination. And so what we see, one of the ways I, I try to articulate it is we see the Tower of Babel, the technocratic solution to the problem of evil, the enthusiasm, and then falling into Sodom and Gomorrah. Consume everything you can for tomorrow we die. And we're in this back and forth between the, more, the, the idyllic imagination and the diabolical. It's like a manic depressive move. So the diabolical imagination has this brutal, raw, crude, harsh imagination that rejects all goodness. Think of pornography, for example, which is deep hatred of the flesh. Sometimes we make the error to think, oh, pornography is an inordinate love of the flesh. No, it's a hatred of the flesh. The wonderful philosopher Josef Pieper makes the distinction between Puritanism and pornography are both two sides of the same coin of a hatred of the flesh, not a nourishing love and respect of the goodness of the human being created in the image of God. Think of all the horror movies and all the kind of diabolical raw perversity. This is the diabolical uh, imagination. Uh, look at our current secularism. Notice what's happening. As we become more secular, we actually start to combine with a new mythology and new paganism. So we have a mythical materialism now. It's not science. The idea, everybody talks about being scientific, but it's highly mythical. And it's part of the diabolical imagination. So you, you'll notice and I'll be specific here, you'll notice, for example, the idyllic imagination of to create the thousand-year Reich of the German National Socialists and the diabolical imagination of the concentration camps. The idyllic imagination of the Soviets and the diabolical imagination of the gulags. The idyllic imagination of transhumanism and living forever, and technological solutions to love, life, sex, and death, and the diabolical imagination of taking organs from poor people, eugenics, abortion, and so on, and so on. So unless we rehabilitate the moral imagination, we always go back and forth between the idyllic and the diabolical until, of course, civilization crushes, or we rehabilitate the moral imagination. So this leads me to part two, which is several things we can do or begin to think about doing to help develop the moral imagination. So I have a list here of 14. I won't be able to obviously go through all of them in detail or we'd be here till tomorrow. <clears throat> but then at least some of us would be on time for mass. So that's good. <laughs> so... So, maybe I will. <laughs> so there's a lot of material here. I'm hoping at some point to put this in a book. So I'd like to at least touch on some of them briefly. And the point here is really to get a discussion started. And I hope that you will have some other things you can suggest to me to think about uh, or critiques as we, as we wrestle with these things. But I wanted to spend some time laying out what Burke means by the moral imagination, and then connect it to the important 20th century writers, C.S. Lewis, Russell Kirk, T.S. Eliot, and on. And one more very important Catholic 20th century thinker who will, I think, create a, a, the, the, the doorway, the portal for us to start thinking about how to build the moral imagination. The English historian Christopher Dawson, uh, who taught at Harvard and a number of other places, he wrote a lot of books, uh, wrote an essay called The Historic Reality of Christian Culture. And he was talking about Christian education, but I think that there are parallels to building the moral imagination. So let's use this as a starting point. Dawson says, ready, quote, do I have the quote? Yes, it's in your handout. This is a good handout. <laughs> he says, Christianity has been deprived. All the channels have been closed by unbelief or choked by ignorance. The means by which we communicate Christianity and all of the past 
how we communicate Christianity and the past, are closed. Christianity has been deprived of a means of outward expression and communication. So it is the task of Christian education to present and recover these lost channels of communication. Dawson said, listen, nobody believes in philosophy anymore. It's too esoteric. They can't get it. Theology, totally incomprehensible. This is Dawson. I mean, we actually have some really good theologians in the room and uh, Joseph Ratzinger and Wojtyla and many others, right, who are really serious theologians who have made theology comprehensible. But theology in many ways is, is incomprehensible. Like I said, I went to Notre Dame and took it. <clears throat> so we have to think, how do we recover these lost channels? Dawson said the dominant ideas of our day are technological, and the only remedy to this destruction of the moral imagination, that's my use of that, is this religious education in the larger sense of the word. So it doesn't simply mean catechism class, but religious education in the larger sense of the world. So for Dawson, cultus, that is religion, is the driving force of culture. If your religion is Christianity, your culture is Christian. If your religion is Muslim, culture is Muslim. If your religion is paganism or technocracy, there's your answer. So we have to recover this. So let's go through several of these ideas. The first one is the most fun. Read good stories. I've already touched on the importance of stories, so we can go uh, pretty quickly, but it's absolutely true. Children need good stories, and adults need good stories. We need to renew and purify our imaginations. And we especially need fairy tales. Now, why are fairy tales so important? Because fairy tales see the world very clearly in terms of good and evil. Right? Little children don't usually ask um, Jesuit casuistry questions. They just want to know, is the guy good or is he bad? And we're like, well, you know, does he have remote material cooperation? And that's not the question you get from a child. <laughs> And because children are not naturally relativists. And fairy tales help develop this moral sense that, that we already have. Right? So St. Thomas Aquinas says the first principle of, the, of, of practical reason, that's of the natural law, is that good is to be done and pursued and evil is to be avoided. That's what all human beings apprehend, unless we get corrupted. And fairy tales help refine this because they teach children to intuit, in, in articulate rationality, good and evil without having to experience going into the forest and trying to be eaten by the, the candy lady's house. <laughs> so you're, exper you're gaining experience through literature. Kirk talks about this. Himmelfarb talks about this. The late John Sr. talks about this in The Death of Christian Culture. You gain experience through literature. There's a number of very fine books that I have in your, in your um, recommendation. Uh, one is Vegan Gorian. He's a professor at the University of Virginia, wrote a book called Tending the Heart of Virtue. I highly recommend it. Mitchell Calpagian wrote a lovely book called The Mysteries of Life in Children's Literature, and I already mentioned John Sr. John Sr. says, we can't actually read the great books unless we first read the good books. So the good books not only have a, a, a pedagogical and educational element, they also help prepare us to read Odyssey and the Iliad and the Aeneid, and Dante, and on and on. So fairy tales specifically are important because they help articulate experiences of like a good wish versus a bad wish. That This is what Calpagian and, and, and Gurian develop. So for example, um, you have the idea of the fish, you know the, the famous story of the fisherman and his wife, where the fisherman goes out and he catches a magic fish. And the fish says please don't eat me and I'll give you any wish you want. He's a pretty content fellow, so he says, oh, okay, and he puts him back. He goes home to his wife and he says, hey, I, I found a fish, a magic fish. Well, what'd you ask for? Well, nothing, we were fine. She goes, what? Go back and ask him. I want a bigger house. So he goes back and he asks him for the bigger house and she gets the bigger house. And then a couple months later, she's tired of that and she wants a mansion. So he gets a mansion and he gets, this goes back and forth and back and forth. And you know, ultimately, she wants to be the queen. And finally, the fish says, that's enough. And he puts her back in her little hovel. And we learn from that both good wishes and bad wishes, greed. But we also learn something very important. We don't, material things 
bigger and bigger don't make us content. Of course, the very famous story, when you're a child, it doesn't strike you, I think, as, um, as seriously. But there's this, the story of King Midas and his search for gold. And the father who loves his dear daughter but wants gold so much that he ends up destroying his daughter for his love of gold. This is the fairy tale for parents. Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik says, I think it's Rabbi Soloveitchik says, we all sacrifice our children to something, to some God, to some idol. Either we bless our children so that they serve the one true God, or we sacrifice our children to money, honor, getting into Yale, becoming successful, whatever it might be. And there's this tension going on. And King, King Midas tells us a lot through a simple fairy tale. Now, of course, there's much to say here, but we see that fairy tales awaken the moral imagination. Well, that's the fun one because you can go home tonight and say, hey, let's read a fairy tale. But here's the second one. We need to detox. This is much harder because we need to resensitize ourselves to good and evil. And this means we probably need to watch less television and fewer movies, which is harder to do. Or, you know, whatever internet site, like, hey, let's look at the Drudge Report to see you know, some, you know, three-headed weird thing, right? So we're, we're all, we want this kind of entertainment constantly, but what happens is we become desensitized to evil. And part of what we need to do is resensitize ourselves to good and evil. I don't watch television shows, but one time I was on an airplane and I said, I'm going to watch television shows. I, I was actually watched it. It was purely for academic purposes. Uh, <laughs> I actually did watch it for a moral, this, when I was first doing this work on the moral imagination, I watched these three television shows. One of them was Glee, unfortunately. Uh, another one was called Suburbigatory, which has gone to hell. And the other one was called The Big Bang Theory. Do not watch these shows. Um, anyway, I was, first I was a little shocked. I don't know why I was, but I was. I was like, oh my goodness, this is primetime television. I mean, I cannot tell you because some of the people who are in the ages of the people in the room, but let me tell you, it was bad. All right, I won't do that. But everything, like this, this deeply broken uh, idea, and all covered with kind of banal pop music to make you feel good about yourself. But in reality, each of those lives would have been destroyed, and those lives were given to us as a model to emulate. And what happens is we watch that over and over and over again, and we become desensitized to evil. I did had this problem. Well, I still have this problem, but I had this problem. I remember in my, tw in my 20s, I was about 27, 25 years old, and I liked all kinds of music, except heavy metal. I never like, kill a cat! I never got that. But anyway, <laughs> I liked all kinds of music. I listened to all these kinds of music. And um, it came clear to me that it was corrupting my intellect and my moral life. Slowly. And so I threw away like 100 CDs. And somebody's like, why didn't you give them to me? I'm like, well, I'm not going to give them to you. They're, I'm throwing them away for a reason, right? It's like, here, eat this poison. So, <laughs> and I thought, like, come on, it doesn't affect me. But the facts are, music affects us. And this is what Plato was so clear about in the Republic. If you haven't read Alan Bloom's chapter on music and closing of the American mind, I highly recommend it. Think about what the culture of rock and roll is. I was actually talking to a, a person who has a PhD in music theory, and he explained um, that rock and roll, sometimes it's like, it's like it pulls you down. It's like something heavy upon you. And part of it actually has to do with the drum beat and the way the chords and the fifths. This is above my pay grade. But, but I want you to think music is a serious thing. Plato says, if we lose the concept of the good in music and dance, then the entire educational project, Greek or foreign, is compromised. So think about this. Here we are at Sacred Heart Academy trying to do classical education. And if Plato's right, if we lose the concept of the good in music and dance, the educational pro project is compromised. Something worth considering. Number three is a bit philosophical but a very important idea that I'm going to go through quickly, and that is we have to rehabilitate reason. Now, this is a prime theme of Benedict XVI's papacy, and very important is his, his, his lecture called the Regensburg Address. Has anyone read the Regensburg Address? 
Okay, great. So you know, in the Regensburg Address, that Benedict was critiquing our dominant vision of reason. If you think about what I said about Burke in the beginning, you'll see a parallel. Burke's worried about hyper-rationality. Benedict says we've limited our reason to the empirical. We've limited to the empirical. So whatever is empirically verifiable, this is wood, this is metal, this is plastic, I'm so tall, etc. only that is in the realm of reason. And everything that's not empirical is outside the realm of reason. Now, of course, the empirical is in the realm of reason, of course. The problem is modern rationality says if it's not empirically verifiable, it's outside the realm of reason. Well, there's two huge problems with that. Number one, obviously, that statement is not empirically verifiable. It does not hold on its own terms. Notice when something is not empirically, or when something is fundamentally incoherent in itself, the seeds are violence. It's the seeds of violence. It's like the problem of truth. People say, truth does not exist. Really? Is that true? I like the smart students I used to teach undergraduates say, well, okay, yeah, 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 truth exists, but you can't know it. It's like, really? Do you know that? Absolutely, I know it. <laughs> so, well, I, well, that's a truth. What's well, the only truth I know? Well, that's two truths, right? So it's incoherent on its own terms. The second, and this goes right to the moral imagination, is think about the most fundamental human experiences. Love, beauty, truth, goodness, right, wrong, friendship, mercy, compassion, justice. They're not empirical. So they're outside the realm of reason. Justice is only efficiency and power. Love is just a chemical reaction. Sometimes when I'm feeling very romantic, I look at my wife, I say, my chemicals are very attracted to your chemicals, lady. <laughs> she responds, my chemicals are too. My neurons are firing at this moment. All right. So it's a, the reduction of reason is the abolition of man. So I'm going to go just quickly through the next ones and, we'll just, and then we'll finish off. The next one is the recovery of objective beauty. And this is both a philosophical point and a practical point of training ourselves in aesthetic taste. And both of these are very difficult. Now, we generally think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and that's partially true. Because each of us is a unique, unrepeatable human person who comes to a beautiful object, a landscape, or a piece of music, and brings our hopes, wants, dreams, and fears to that. And we experience in a way that only you individually can experience. So it is a personal experience. But it's also the objective reality that is causing something in you. And we've taken that idea that we're each unique, unrepeatable persons, which is sublime, and we've turned it into the most banal thing. Like, well, everybody's got their own opinion. But think about it, what it does. And this relates to the point called recovering authentic subjectivity. It undermines the depth of our purpose, of our subjective nature. Because think about it. Let's say I am looking at something, right? And... David's looking at something. And David and I are looking at the same thing, and he has experience of it, and I have an experience of it. Well, if it's actually out there, he can tell me what he saw, and I can tell him what, he, what I saw. And maybe I'm wrong, and I can be corrected. And maybe he's, maybe he's wrong. Or maybe my soul can be expanded, and I can see something else. And both of us grow as human beings. But if it's just his opinion... I don't care unless he can do something for me, right? So the lady says, that's a beautiful painting. She's cute. I think it's beautiful too. I need a ride home. Whatever you think, every human relationship becomes transaction. Because if you're, just, if you're not talking about anything, then it doesn't really matter. I will say one thing pedagogically. I teach undergraduate students. And one thing young people want is to hold their emotions they want to keep them valid. They're important to them, and they should be. And I have to look in a relativistic world where beauty is in the eye of the beholder and everything's relativism. Your emotions don't matter at all. But if we recover objective beauty, we can also begin to recover 
objective morality and recover authentic subjectivity where beauty is in the behind of the beholder, but not only there. And that's how we grow as persons. There's a beautiful quote, which I'm not going to read to you because it's in your handout, but I promise you, you should read it by Cardinal Ratzinger that talks about the importance of beauty and holiness in, 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 in our apologetic work. And so this, is, you see, is connected to the idea of sanctifying worship. It's very important that we make a distinction between the sacred and the profane. One of the big problems today is that our worship is often um, has been enlightenmentized. We can't tell that there's something mysterious and beautiful and transcendent and powerful coming on. I'm sorry, going on. Right? When the Bible says, we have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, with festal gatherings of angels and the firstborn, we're entering in to the mysteries of heaven. But instead we hear like, gather us in, or go make a difference, or this, you know, ugly church music. This has sociological and it has a moral impact to us. So part of recovering of the moral imagination is this rehabilitating and sanctifying worship. Number seven is rehabilitate the heart. I've kind of talked about that a little bit. This is recovering the idea of the chest. Number eight, and I'm going fast because Mike Tober told me I have to end, um, and you need to go home. Uh, number eight is respect language. There's a beautiful book. It's in your, in your list called uh, The Abuse of Language, Abuse of Power by the great late German philosopher Josef Pieper. This goes back to courage and the moral imagination. One of the challenges we have today is not offering incense to the Roman gods, but offering incense to politically correctness, as I said. And one of the ways we fight that is by telling the truth and using language well. Now, that's easier for me to do than others because I have no friends to lose. But if you have friends to lose, it can be hard, so you need courage. But I highly recommend that. The ninth is we have to build community. And that's a deep, that's not community of like going to a coffee shop and having coffee with your friends. That's great. But authentic community, and, and the sociologist Robert Nisbet is very good on this, has authority built into it. It makes moral demands on us. We need to build communities that make moral demands. The 10th, and I'll do this quickly, is we need to build plausibility structures. Now, this is, comes from the, the sociologist Peter Berger. And a plausibility structure means we can talk about all these ideas all we want, but if we don't see them lived out in practice, then it's like a fairy tale. So we need to make these ideals and ideas of nobility actual. And that's called a plausibility structure. Now, the good news is, for those of you who go to this parish know, Sacred Heart and Sacred Heart Academy is a plausibility structure. Many people think it's impossible to do what we do. And then they come, like, oh my goodness, how did you do that? Wait a minute, how is the auto orientum? That's impossible. <laughs> no, it's, it's, he is, he's there. All right? How are they reading those books? There's the book. It's in the backpack. I mean, look at the back. You can't see the child because all you can see is the backpack. But, <laughs> but it's possible. Um, you know, I, I, I lived in Japan for five years, and I was a Christian among pagans. I thought I was a really good Christian. <laughs> I was like, man, I'm really good. And then I went to Steubenville, and I thought, wow, I'm really bad. Uh, <laughs> but I realized Steubenville was a plausibility structure, um, and there are many other places too. What it was is young girls and boys could go to Steubenville. They didn't want to be in the hookup culture. And there were boys and girls, men and women, in friendship, relationship. That's not perfect. But in friendship and relationship with, with each other that said, this can be done. I don't have to live like that. I can live in another way. And so creating plausibility structures is a very, very important point that we can't neglect. And finally, we need to refine our manners. Burke talked a lot about the importance of manners. There's a Secular French philosopher, he said, manners are almost human. No, sorry, no, sorry. Manners are almost virtues. And human beings are almost apes. And there's this connection that manners actually matter. Two other, three other things. We need to go outside. 
and see the world. Uh, it being outside, it, we're, we're created in the image of likeness of God as embodied persons. Our bodies aren't extra. We need to be outside. There's actually done studies. Japanese did studies on how going out into the forest and standing in the woods helps like lower your blood pressure, organize, clear your mind. For the record, we have woods behind our house. Five dollars, come see our woods. <laughs> Thirteen is cultivate silence. Dietrich von Hildebrand says, in order to be reverent before the world, you need to have stillness of heart. And you can't have stillness and silence unless you're reverent. And of course, some of you know Cardinal Seurat has a beautiful book on silence. And then finally, honor the Lord's Day. Uh, Dr. Schmidtke and I actually did a series on the Lord's Day, so you can um, listen to that. But honoring the Lord's Day is a very important uh, way to stop the quotidian rush and to reflect on what it means to be the human being created by God for the seventh day. We are not made simply uh, to work, although we are made to work, we are also made to rest. So in conclusion, I would say we're in a battle. The beginning of Plato's Gorgias says war and battle. It's a battle, Vogelin says it's a war and battle for the younger generation. And we need to build an intellectual scaffolding, a framework for a new understanding to recover the moral imagination. The Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci said about the socialists, we're gonna make a march, a long march through the institutions of culture. That has happened. The march is complete. The secular paganism owns the culture. And so we have to recover the lost channels. And we begin, I think, obviously first in prayer, and worship, but we also begin in recover, by recovering the institutions by building and developing our moral imagination. So thank you for your time tonight.